And welcome into the round table. Bill Priestley here with you. And we've had a colossal amount of ships building in, uh, or just order, I should say, in recent years. And what is that going to do to the maritime industry? Joining us to talk about it, Greg Miller joins us, our senior writer from New York, and also Dr. Sal Mercagliano from Campbell University joining us as well. Gentlemen, thanks so much for stopping in. And uh, this is going to be an interesting subject for a at least a couple of years. Um, Greg, you wrote about this late last month. We've got a couple of charts here that I want to throw up here shortly. But you wrote about this about a month ago. Um, numbers are huge here. Uh, what What is right now look this looking like as far as the shipping landscape goes um, uh, with all of these new ships that are going to be coming into port? Yeah, the numbers are absolutely huge. I mean, we've been talking about it for a couple of years. Uh, it takes two years to build a ship, uh, and and now they're coming. Uh, you know, the, the deluge is really starting this month, uh, and it's going to be relentless for years ahead. I mean, to put the numbers in context, you can look at the order book as the ratio of capacity on order to the capacity on the water. Right now, it's about 30%. Uh, usually it takes about 15% for replacement, so double that. Um, and that. That may not seem much compared to the 2008 order book, which was at 60%, but that was off a smaller base. If you look at the absolute capacity on order, uh, there's about 7.7 .7 million TEUs on order now, and in 2008, 2010, it never got past 6.6, uh, .6. so all-time record. And uh, just looking at the numbers per year, it's in, sort of it's incredible. I mean, this year, 2.5 million TEUs, or about thir a third of the total. Next year, 3 million TEUs, 38% of the total. And then 2025, thereafter, 2.2 million TEUs, or 30% of the total. So really just a relentless barrage uh, of, of new container ships uh, that are going to be coming on starting now for years ahead. Uh, and then just on the size, it's very different by the size categories. If you look at the mid-sized and larger ships, 10,000 TEUs or larger, uh, the order book to fleet ratio is 52%, whereas the sub 10,000 TEU, it's 14%. So just uh, we've never seen this much new capacity coming online this quickly. Yeah, this, uh, Sal, I'll just put it to you very simply, is this even, is this detrimental to the shipping industry when you put this much capacity into the market over the course of the next couple of years? Well, the other equation that has to be thrown into this is the element of ship construction and ship propulsion. So a lot of these vessels, besides being much bigger, as Greg noted right there, is featuring new types of engine propulsion, and particularly greener fuel. Because of IMO 2020, 2023, and the standard to get to by 2050, you have got to start changing out fleets. And it's the container ships right now that we're seeing that done on. Tankers and bulkers, not so much, but definitely in the container industry, we're seeing that a lot more LNG power, a lot more methanol fuel power. And this is going to be a key element here because ships have got to increase their capacity, or at least shipping lines have got to increase capacity to conform to this new rule, which will require them at some times to slow steam and monitor their carbon emissions. So I think while we're seeing it right now in the container industry, we can expect to see it when the tanker and the bulk industry begin their big swap outs. The other element here, too, is where these ships are being built. We're seeing China really emerge as the big builder for vessels. 94% of all ships are built in China, Korea, and Japan. But this year, China has uh, grabbed about 47% of that. That's that's more than Japan and Korea combined. Greg, let me go back to you. You already mentioned some of the numbers. I think we have a couple of charts here that we can we can throw up in terms of what's coming down the pipe uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, but looking at that, was this a situation, say for instance, where everyone kind of looked at, hey, there's a there's a possibility that we can make some money here. Let's throw the, go ahead and throw this up, which you had in your article uh, in terms of what's coming uh, in the next couple of years. You see the different ships or the different carriers and, and how many ships are, are coming to them over the course uh, of the next couple couple of years and then we have one more chart which will show the size of the ships there that are coming in as well most of them of course in that medium um, size there uh, in the middle Greg was this a situation perhaps where everyone kind of looked at it and say hey we're going to be making some money over the course of the next couple of years uh, obviously with of, with of course the the, the new fuel uh, regulations and, and that requirement there as well but um, Everybody said, oh, if we go up 10, 15 percent, we'll be OK. And then everybody decided, well, let's make more money. So let's build more ships so we'll have more of a piece of the pie. And that's what everybody did. 
I mean, that's not really the way I look at it. Uh, in the container shipping industry, uh, you know, the business is to have ships, is to operate ships. You need ships. And uh, the time when you order ships is when you can, when you have money to order ships, when you can finance those ships. Uh, the container industry has gone through some terrible times, uh, particularly in 2015, 2016, and there weren't a lot of ships ordered prior to COVID, uh, and the ships got older and older. Even right now, the average age of a container ship is 15 years. The ships are very old. Uh, so, uh, you know, what they wanted to do is essentially replace their fleet uh, with more fuel-efficient ships. I mean, if you go back to the last big order wave in 2008, 2010, you know, the carriers were basically trying to lower their unit costs because they couldn't, they didn't have any pricing power. So uh, the way to improve their, their, their margins was to lower their costs. And the way they did it back then was a step size. They built these very big 20,000 TU ships. So the last wave was all about the fleet getting bigger. Uh, and, and this wave is primarily also about lowering unit costs, but the way they're doing that is they're ordering much more fuel efficient ships. The ships built back before 2015 and even before 2010 are much, much less fuel efficient uh, than the vessels that are being built today. Uh, so it just makes sense. The carriers had money. Uh, uh, they saw a way that they could replace their fleet and lower their unit costs by sort of swapping out uh, and building a new fleet of vessels. There is one nuance there. There, there is a sort of a step change in the in the new builds this this time around in the midsize area, because the Panama Canal was expanded in 2016, and so the older vessels that used to go through the Panama Canal were about 4,000, 5,000 TEUs. They were very boxy, not fuel efficient. Uh, the new ships, the Neo Panamaxes, are 13 to 15,000 TEUs, uh, and they're much much more fuel efficient. And uh, if you looked at those charts, that is the sweet spot uh, where most of uh, the new container ships are being built. I mean, of course, they're building some of the bigger ships, especially order uh, delivered this year for the Asia-Europe route. But from the U.S. perspective, what you want to look at is those 13,000, 15,000 TEU ships that are being built, and they're going to give the carriers uh, a much lower unit cost in the future. Yeah. Um, Sal, coming back to you in terms of um, the, the, the amount of capacity coming into the market, one of the things that we've talked about in the past, uh, uh, well, let's look at the immediate versus the long term effect of what could happen here with this. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up, and this may be a moot point, but it may be something to talk about, is the emergence, of course, that we talked about these shadow fleets uh, that are maneuvering oil around, uh, you know, uh, irregardless of, of, of insurance or of, of sanctions uh, in various areas. With all these ships that are coming offline, does this give the shadow fleet, uh, these shadow fleets a chance to bulk up their capacity and perhaps be a bigger player in the market? Yeah, you know, go back to real quick something that, that Greg said, which I think leads right okay. into what you're talking about, Bill. Number one, the idea that that a thirteen to fifteen thousand TU ship is, is is medium is funny today because you know back in the day that there was a monster of a vessel. Yeah. Uh, the other element there that kind of builds in the shadow fleet is you got to remember, so a lot of these operators, a lot of the big carriers didn't own a lot of their ships. They leased them. So you had these non-owner operators out there that were leasing a lot of vessels to them. If you look at Zim, for example, Zim, just prior to going into the supply chain crisis, owned one ship and leased about 100 vessels. And one of the things you're seeing right now are, are the main shipping carriers, MSC, Maersk, are buying a lot more tonnage so that they don't have to lease them. They don't want to get 100% because, again, you want to have that flexibility in the fleet so that you can shed tonnage when you don't need it. But I think the big issue is going to see is where these non-owner operators, the Atlases, the C-SPANs, uh, will go in the future because those are the ones that have invested a lot in shipping. They, they're doing very well right now because they've got guaranteed ship leases through 2024, 2025. But now what you're seeing is the, uh, the shipping companies are adjusting a bit. And it's very much similar to what you're talking about with the Shadow Fleet, where the Russians are pushing ships into companies to be able to move their cargo, you know, Know, off off book, so to speak. You know, they're leasing it out to these other operators to do it, and you see that a lot with the big container carriers, where they'll take some ships from an outfit like Atlas or C-SPAN, bring them in for a few years, operate them, and then when they don't need them, they need the shed tonnage, they'll return them back. But now you're seeing these companies invest in ownership in in vessels. They'll never get to 100%, but I think what we're going to see here is much larger ownership of their fleets than perhaps we saw previously. Because again, what happened after 2000. 
2008 and 2015 is a lot of selling off of material and equipment and scrapping. And I think that's the other element we're going to start seeing a lot of is more container ship scrapping going on as these ships reach the end of their lives and get bled off from the big carriers. Gotcha there. We've got about a minute left here. Greg, uh, five years from now, given this development we're seeing now, uh, who gets the most benefit out of it and who perhaps is most hurt by it? Uh, the most benefit would be the carriers themselves because uh, they can essentially take the new ships that are much more efficient and meet the new environmental rules. They can allow the, uh, the vessels that they chartered they have many more ships on charter now than they do on order, so they can allow the, sh allow the ships on charter to go back to the non-operating owners. Uh, and those non-operating owners, if they can't find a new home for those ships, uh, are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to scrap them. Um, but, you know, don't feel too bad for the non-operating owners. They just went through the best period in their history as well. They are, are cash rich, and they've paid for those ships that they leased out many times over, and they can just charter them and pocket a couple more million. Sal, same thing. Who's who's this benefit the most and who's it hurt the most? Oh, I think the ocean carriers are, you know, awash in it right now. I think they're, they're in the driver's seat, so to speak. And, and I think they're in a position now where they're trying to restructure their fleet. And remember, they're not just investing in new technologies and new ships. They're also expanding into different areas. We're seeing that with Maersk, MSC, and all the big carriers are becoming much more logistically oriented, whether it's air transportation, e-commerce, or delivery from, you know, warehouse to home. Gotcha. Gentlemen, it's going to be an interesting, changing world in the maritime freight. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take a short break and be back right after this.